Hello, Peter. Uh, welcome back to More Allerton Golf Thank Club. It's great to have you here. Um, just want to, you know, talk through your times of being here and, you know, about the course. Um, we're really proud of the golf course and how it's matured over the years. And I just wanted, what do you think to it at the minute? And how it looks? Well, it looks terrific because I remember when we first uh, came here, Bert Williamson and my joint pro at the time, there were very few uh, trees on the course. You know, we, we had the, my wife and I, uh, tarted up, you might say, with the derelict old house at the top, which was the original farm. Yeah. And we did it up and uh, you could see right across to the Vale of York and away in the distance. And uh, over the years, the trees have grown and... Uh, you're getting to the stage now where you've got to thin a few out, which is uh, when you go back 30, 40 years, it's, uh, it's extraordinary how it's developed. Because it was very romantic at that time. It was the first golf course done in this country by Robert Trent Jones, who was the father, the really, modern father of golf course architecture. He introduced the sort of runway tees and big greens and lots of undulation. And it was, uh, it was very exciting times for the club because they'd gone from a very pleasant but flat, gentle course to 27 holes of a very different character. Yeah, yeah. And so there was some apprehension amongst the members whether it would, whether it would work. Yeah. But I'm delighted. It took a few years to get it going, but I'm delighted the way things have worked out. Yeah, yeah. the big greens and the big tees, very American design. Big flat bunkers. It? Yeah, yeah, real American design, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So you said that it was a, uh, golf was a, you know, and morality was an experience larger than life. And what did you mean by that? Well, it was grand. I mean, I was, uh, my father was the professional at Ferndown Golf Club, which about six miles north of Bournemouth you know, in the south. And it was a gentle club full of doctors, lawyers, accountants, that sort of thing. Not much trade about, you know, not many uh, ordinary shopkeepers. And then my brother and I uh, went to Parkson Golf Club, which was, different. They were more cosmopolitan and uh, overlooking Pool Harbour, which was very, very pretty. We were there. I was there for, what, 10, 13 years. And then I came up here and uh, with the new clubhouse, it was, uh, it was all very grand uh, and it was a new world. It was uh, very exciting to come into it and uh, see how it's all developed over the years. It was, everything was very exciting for me at that time and it's always remained very dear to my heart. That's great, yeah. Um, how long were you the professional here? I was here for 10 years. I was here with Bert Williamson for, for, for all, of the, um, all of the 70s. Right. Um, but halfway through the 70s, I was getting more and more involved with the television. 1974, the Pro Celebrity Golf started, which was a big deal. It wasn't supposed to be, the BBC thought they might keep it going for about three or four years. It ran for 14 years and then it went to Channel 4. But it, I was becoming more and more involved with that. And then the club, um, in their wisdom, thought, you know, I was away quite a bit and Bert was anxious to sort of, well, well not take over, but he did virtually take over. I, I sort of semi-retired from being an active member of the pro shop here, but still represented the club and I was... Uh, which I still do to this day. I, I, I don't give it quite, a, I'm not in a position to give it quite as many mentions on the yeah, television yeah. now because the BBC is in its death throes as far as golf is concerned. But uh, that's how it came. Bert took over and he, he was here a few more years and then he moved on. So uh, the first, I, I was involved here for, and lived here for 10 years, which was a very, very informative part of my life. Great stuff. Out of the holes, out of all the 27 holes, is there any particular holes that you know stood out to you? Well, I always thought before it was before it was um, it had to be altered because of safety reasons. The long par five at the far was it about 14th? Is it the fourth yeah. or into the corner? Yeah. I thought that corner with the pond and the out of bounds and the bank on the right and the big trees. I mean, there were a lot of. It was a very different looking golf course. We hadn't seen. Uh, many, if any, American-style golf courses in Britain up to that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, to see these vast bunkers, and as it brought a whole new skills of green keeping in. We had machines to do the bunkers, as you said, of the old fella raking them by hand every day. But I thought the 14th, it was, it was a rather frightening with the, the green tucked up in the corner and the, the bushes and the trees and the pond. And, the, you know, it, it, it was visually, I thought it was looked very nice. And then followed by the little short hole. 
And then, of course, the, the look from the 18th tee down the hill with, uh, with the clubhouse nestling down below yeah. looked um, very dramatic. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, and then just, I want to talk about the modern game, really. I mean, how do you think the modern game's progressing? Oh, it's always different now. I mean, but if you go back historically, uh, it must have been the sort of conversation that golf has had over the last hundred years or more. You know, the, the, if you look at the old clubs, you wonder how on earth they got round the course at all with those tools they had in those days. And then uh, steel shafts came in, more refined size of, of golf club heads came in in the late 20s, all through the 1930s. And then, of course, we moved on and uh, golf clubs, match sets came. Uh, there weren't any match sets until the, what, well, the early 1930s, I suppose. You did it all by feel. Oh, that feels all right there. Some clubs had a whippy shaft and some had a, like a poker. So it was, it was just done by feel. And then uh, metal came back. But people think when metal heads came in, that was a revolution. They had metal heads in the 1930s. They were made of aluminium. Yes. And they put sand in the heads to give them weight. Uh, and then when they came in, the people that didn't know said, oh, this is revolutionary, this is all new, and they've never seen it before. I don't think they'll ever go back to wood. I don't think so. But it's, uh, you know, people don't repair clubs. And I feel very sorry for the uh, ordinary, when I say the ordinary club, I mean not the tournament pros, not the ones that, that live that glamorous existence. The, one that, the ones that have a very nice job, hopefully, at a club which is friendly and good members, Certain of the things that I was brought up with aren't needed. And nobody puts a whipping on clubs and a little string around the head. Nobody puts, you still put the occasional new grip on, but you break a club, you, you throw it away now. I mean, it's quite extraordinary that uh, in the winter time, the pro used to spend hours, he used to fill his day uh, re-varnishing club heads and scraping the old va varnish off and repainting them, redoing them, restaining them. That's what saw him through the winter. But that aspect, the golf balls are much better. It's any sport you see, football. I mean, I, I remember footballers with heavy leather boots and big leather studs and the ball itself was solid leather. When it got wet and muddy, you could hardly lift it up. Now it's almost like a beach ball and they play in carpet slippers. You never see a pitch with any mud on it now. You look at some of the old pictures of the first division, as it was called then, the Premier Division now in the winter time, whether it was Manchester United's ground or Wolverhampton Wanderers or the Arsenal, it was just a sea of mud most of the time. Now you never see, you never see any worn areas. So things improve and everything, everything is different. And so you have to move with the times. There's no good living back then. You've got to move, you don't have to like it all. And you are allowed, you're still allowed to express an opinion, just. You're just about allowed to express an opinion before it's either called racist or sexist. But that's another world which I'm not familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, golfers are now, you'd probably regard them as athletes, wouldn't you? you, you know, they're, they're well, they've taken it, yes. It's become, um, golfers have become, I don't say like lemmings, but uh, Gary Player, it probably was. Di Rees before him, great Welsh player. Yeah. He used to train with the Arsenal Football Club. His great love was, was, was the golf, his family. Uh, South Hearts Golf Club and the Arsenal football team, which he used to go and train with. Uh, he used to do some exercises, Max Faulkner also. Then along came Gary Player, who, who trained and trained and trained. And, and he, he had a wonderful vocabulary and told wonderful exaggerated stories. And he had success. And so young fellas started to copy. Well, if he does 50 press-ups, I'll do it. Well, make me a better player. It doesn't necessarily make you a better player, but you get it in your head. If I do this, that, and the other, I'll get better. Uh, some of them, I think, today are overtrained. They're, they look like they're, they're uh, hoping to get a, a job playing Tarzan in a new film or something. They're all like this, which I don't think does much for them. And they're always pulling muscles. Nobody ever was injured when I played. Yeah, yeah. And now I've done my shoulder. How do you, well, lifting these weights and doing this, that, and the other. They all look men. You don't see any eccentric golfers now. Not many. Maybe that many. Yeah. Overweight and a bit podgy, you know. And uh, <coughs> it's very. It's a very different world. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I mean, we're talking about those athletes there. We t we're just talking briefly about Rory McIlroy. You know, not big, not a big guy, but you know, physically very good. Um, who do you think's the best player out there at the minute? Oh, I don't think you can say. The, I don't think you can say who's the best player because there are about six, seven, eight, or nine of them all at the same time. 
there was a period when Tiger Woods was head and shoulders above everything. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a time when Tiger Woods was the head and, uh, head and shoulders of everybody. He had Jim Furyk and a few others who were his only real opposition. But uh, today's uh, cast of players, rather like uh, the Nicholas Player, Palmer, uh, Greg Norman era, you know, there were, there were Ernie Els, a young Ernie Els. There were lots of them around about the same time. Tiger was brilliant, but he was Gulliver in a land of pygmies, really. That may be brutal, but I think that's, uh, in my opinion, that's what it was. And today you've got, you've got so many, but when he's on form, when he's on form, I don't think there's anybody more exciting than Rory McIlroy. But, there, you know, there's, there's half a dozen of them now, so it, it all depends who gets the breaks, who has a bit of good luck, who has a bit of bad luck, who holds a putt, who misses a putt. That's the way it is now. But there's a good there's a good crop and many many young fellows. When I say young, under thirty, uh, and there are some on the continent who we haven't really heard of yet. There's a couple of uh, there's a German boy and a couple of Spanish lads who are young, uh, 17, 18, mm. and a French lad who uh, might might go on and be very good indeed. So it's very encouraging, considering that golf on the continent still isn't. Uh, a game for everybody, not like Scotland. I mean, Scotland, since golf was invented, has always been to encourage people to play golf. It wasn't a snobby game, although there, was, there are a number of snobby clubs in Scotland. Don't run away with that idea. But uh, you didn't look sideways at somebody having a set of clubs, car carrying a set of clubs onto a bus. Whereas Dan said, oh, what the hell has he got there? And said, there was he one there. But it's uh, nothing out of the ordinary in Scotland to see people, young people, having uh, sets of clubs carrying about. So it's a, it's a, it's a progressive world in, in golf, but uh, down south particularly, uh, a lot of people are leaving clubs at the moment, whether it's expense, uh, whether it's the financial situation, whether it's young families having to cut back on something. Mum, mum stops going to the gym, dad gives up his golf course membership, yeah. uh, but they still play golf. More people are playing golf, but, but membership's going down, which yes. is interesting. Yeah. They find it uh, easier to find a chub who's a member, so they play a green, you know, they get a green fee at a member's rate, and they know a few people who are members. You know, they can still play their 20 or 30, 40 rounds of golf a year, yeah. and, they, and they're only spending half the money they would use if they were a member. Yes. Okay. So it's, we're going through a transitional period at the moment. Yeah, so. so just to finish on, just some, I just want to. I mean, I'm the I'm the pro at Moralton, and there's some brilliant characters here. I mean, we, we have stories every day of of anything like that. I was just, you know, do you have any stories of the members from, you know, from the past? Well, I I was um, I was with my father at Ferndown, and then my brother and I went to Parkston Golf Club, and we had lots of visitors in the summertime, and there was uh, there was always predominantly uh, overseas people, and we had a lot of Jewish people came to play golf. So I was introduced to a world of Jewish humour, which I find. Uh, I, I like Jewish humour, and uh, there have been very f famous comedians and comedians on the television and film, and, and I like their I like their sense of humour. And there were there were old characters here who was uh, Mr. Fox, who was the, the store detective. He was a funny little fella, and it, it, he was uh, if he saw an unfamiliar face, he used to sort of look out. Who's that? Who's that? You know, he went around worrying about everybody, who, which was interesting. Doddy Aber was another man. One of the old, uh, one of the old time members who was a little bit doddy, a little bit doddery, but he was very kind to me. He always called me Mr. Alice, and Ronnie Summary and the Bellow family, uh, who went, one of the brothers went into politics at the highest level, became Lord Belwin, yeah. and his brother ran a very successful, uh, well, the pair of them had very successful business in Leeds and became president of the club, had every office at the club. Ronnie Summary, the clerk. There were lots of them who were, who were, uh, they became friends and good acquaintances. But I loved the sense of humour, uh, the self-deprecation sometimes. It was, uh, it was just fun. It was just fun. And I, I'm, I'm still as enthusiastic about the club today as I was when I came here in 1970. Yeah, well, it's still fun today. So it's great to have you yeah. back. Very nice All to right. see you. Really nice to have this chat.